You'll be able to bring me back to life. Like, bro, just thinking about that is crazy. Those were Brooks's words when he started the ritual. I always thought it was a joke, until today. Oh wait, sorry, I'm rushing things. Allow me to explain where all this began. Nine years ago, we were returning from our school back to Brooks' house. Mum had finally allowed me for a sleepover after months of asking. In his room, he started rambling about his daily dose of shitty conspiracy theories again. Voodoo dolls or some shit, but this time, he showed me something. Something I took as a joke back then. I shouldn't have. As he rambled about, he handed me a diary, and on the first page it was labelled, How to Bring Me Back from the Dead. What the hell is this? I asked. It is what it says, he replied, a smug smile stretching across his face. Is this another one of your pranks? Who will be the victim this time? You're too stupid. He came forward and snatched the diary out of my hands. See this? This is the real deal. He flipped the pages and handed me the diary back. Look, read this. The pages he handed me had some weird instructions. This is what it said. To be performed only at night, or it won't work. To be done in front of a person who knows you. Find a secluded place to perform the ritual. Draw a pentagram and place three candles around it. Sit in between and draw out your blood. Make three circles with it and then chant out. After that, he had some weird glyphs written. I was pretty sure he wrote that as a joke. Just another well thought out prank. What the hell is even this? You haven't even read anything. I turned the page over to see more glyphs written, none of which made sense to me. I asked the same question again. See, this is the kind of thing that could bring me back to life, he said, pointing at the diary. When I die, that is. I chuckled. Do you really think that? Where the hell did you find this anyway? The dark web, he said, with a sudden shift in his tone. It became more tense, serious. He explained for an hour afterwards how this works, while convincing me it's not a joke. He spoke a foreign tongue which he claimed to be the glyphs, and kept explaining what he had to do, and told me what role I had in all this. So let me get this straight. You do all the things written in the diary, and if I do the same things after you die in the same place this ritual is performed, you'll come back to life? He nodded. I broke out laughing while he stood there, irritated. Where the hell do you even find stuff like this? The dark web, he said in a serious tone. The dark web, I said, mocking him and chuckled. We spent the whole day playing games and doing the typical teenager stuff. The next few days went by smoothly too. Whenever I met Brooke in school or at his home, he always insisted that I learn to speak those glyphs. I just went along with it. What's the worst good that could happen, anyway? It was all just a stupid joke. I thought it was cool speaking another language, even though I didn't bother to ask what it meant. Real shit went down after two weeks. I thought it was just a day like any other. That day, I went out with Brooke to an abandoned building. We both really enjoyed finding and going to places like this. He did come with his backpack, but I didn't think much of it. Maybe he bought some snacks to share. We spent a few hours there, and as soon as night hit, he ushered me to the rooftop, even though I insisted our parents wouldn't like it if we stayed out after dark. He just said he had a surprise for me. In the end, I gave in. It would be boring to walk without him anyway. I reached the roof only to find Brooke on the ground, spreading something. As I got closer, it became clear that he was drawing something with powdered chalk. A pentagram. What the hell are you doing? Oh, you finally came. Step back. He pushed me aside and reached for his bag and pulled three candles out of it and placed them around the pentagram. He then pulled me forward and took my thumb. What are you... I barely spoke out and he pulled out a knife from his pocket and made a deep cut on my thumb. I flinched back. Dude, 
What the hell are you doing? Where'd you even get that thing? I shouted in anger, holding my bloody thumb in agony. He didn't seem to pay any mind to me. He dropped my blood caught in the knife and stepped in the middle. I'm doing the ritual, like we discussed a few days ago. I thought it was only a joke. You'll be able to bring me back to life. Like, bro, just thinking about that is crazy. I tried to stop him, but he just pushed me to the ground. He began speaking a foreign tongue and slowly pulled the knife up to his arm and started to cut it. Small cuts at first. Blood slowly dripped out from his open wounds. I could see the pain on his face, but he didn't stop cutting himself. All while speaking the language, the glyphs. He wasn't joking. He was really doing the ritual. I didn't think it was real. It was all in his head. A stupid thing he found on the internet that he thought to be real. I got up and lurched towards him, but was immediately hit by something in the face and I fell back. I slowly reached for him, but was stopped again by an invisible surface. The surface felt grainy, coarse, like how an old wall feels when it hasn't been skimmed for a long time, but more jagged. This wall stopped me from going inside the pentagram, from reaching Brooke. Was the pentagram protecting him? Brooke now started making bigger, deeper cuts. Blood started to flow out from his arms like tap water. He fell on his knees, tears streaming down his cheeks, but he wasn't stopping. I stomped and punched at the invisible surface, shouting a minute to stop, but to no avail. Seconds later, he dropped the knife and started making circles of blood with his quivering arms. Suddenly, I felt sick in my stomach and my feet became wobbly. I dropped onto the ground, feeling a sense of dread taking over me. I couldn't help but to close my eyes and lay down. It felt like I hadn't slept for days on end. I laid on the ground, knowing that I shouldn't have been tired right at that time. No matter how hard I tried, ordering my muscles to move, I couldn't do it. It's scary, knowing movement my entire life, but not being able to move when I needed it the most. I started hyperventilating, listening to my heart beating loudly in my chest. Seconds later, I felt like something was on top of me, sitting on my chest. I couldn't breathe properly. I couldn't even move my finger at this point. Wind started howling as I lay there on the ground impotently. Just then, I heard someone speaking. A deep, croaky voice reverberated inside my head loudly. I could feel my heart beat at an unnatural rate as it dared to break out of my chest. The voice, it was too fucking loud. I couldn't make anything out of what it was saying. I passed out. I woke up in the garden of my house. It took me a moment to figure out where I was. I sprung up on my feet and looked around and shouted for Brooke. I went inside and found mum and dad were on TV in the upstairs bedroom. I asked them about Brooke. We thought you were out with him, honey, Dad said. I booked it out of the house and went back to the same building on my bike, which I went on before. Upon reaching there, I saw two police cars parked out front and two policemen talking to a man. I went running towards the door, but the police stopped me. Even when I told my friend was in there, told me to go home, I had no choice but to do so. I couldn't stay out all night waiting for him. Is he still in there? How was I in my garden? What happened to him? The plethora of questions flooded my mind. My parents stood at the door when I arrived, asking why I ran off. I put them off and went straight towards sleep. I had no appetite that night. Before sleeping, I noticed some writing seared in on my left thumb, right where Brooke made the cut. I put it off as sustain that night and went to sleep. I had a nightmare. I was standing on some stairs. I walked up to them and found myself standing on the same rooftop where everything went down and Brooke was in front of me, on the edge of the building. 
Every time that I tried to reach him, he jumped. This dream repeated every night for a long time. Next day, my mum told me that Brooke was in the hospital. We rushed our way there to check on him. We couldn't see him yet, but the doctors told us that his arms could have had to be amputated if he wasn't found on the rooftop. The next days were mind boggling. I didn't know how I was in my garden. I didn't know why I blacked out on the roof and I didn't know why there was a mark seed on my thumb. All I could do was wait for him to wake up and tell me everything. Now, I would love to tell you that I got all my answers and we both fared well, but we didn't. Brooks died in the hospital due to blood loss after one of his wounds opened at night when only a few doctors were around and they said, sorry, things got out of hand. I cried for hours on end every single day. The pressure I put on myself, the guilt. I watched my best friend cut his hands in front of me that led him to death while I couldn't do anything. But what if he was right? I knew him. He wouldn't do a thing like that only because he thought it to be fun. If he risked his life for a reason like that, it had to be real. It just had to be. Years later, I found myself scrolling on the dark web scrolling through pages of useless stuff. Many titles were disturbing, like stalking Grant or ruining lives. I didn't click on any of them. That wasn't what I was there for. After hours and hours of searching and scrolling, I found a page labeled bringing dead people back. I clicked on it and found some rules. The same rules that were written in Brooks's diary, just in a formal manner. I skimmed through everything and at the bottom of the page I found instructions. Instructions for the person who wants to bring someone back. Draw a pentagram in the same place where the ritual was performed. Stand in the middle. Draw blood from where you were cut in the ritual. Speak. After that, it had some glyphs written, which I believe to be what Brooke taught me to speak. It had to be. It wouldn't make sense if he taught me anything else. I arrived at the building, the same building where it all went down. A sign was fixed at the main gate, entry restricted. I was hesitant at first, but psyched myself to go in. Reaching the rooftop, I came to see the place where the ritual was held all those years ago. Everything that happened that night flashed before my eyes. I had a sick feeling in my stomach. I sat down for a bit with my head in my hands. It was too much. I looked at the sky, almost dark I thought. I took the chalk powder out of my bag and began to spread it in the formation of a pentagram. Nightfall came. I took the knife out of my bag, stood in the middle of the pentagram and placed the knife over my thumb. I clutched my eyes closed and hesitantly cut my left thumb. It hurt as blood started dripping out of my thumb. I started speaking a foreign tongue. The glyphs. I didn't know what they meant, but I couldn't forget them even after all these years. This time, I dug the knife in my thumb as blood poured over the pentagram. Suddenly, I felt dizzy and fell. I blinked, and in just in one blink, I wasn't falling, but standing somewhere else. Everything was white. Not even a drop of any other shade was present. The only other colour was the dirt of my shoes spreading on the ground. I scanned my surroundings to find myself in a room. Did it work? I contemplated. I went out the door to find a long hallway filled with doors on each side. I went into every door only to find nothing except white. Some rooms had a window covered in white. No matter how I pushed trying to open it, it didn't budge. After what felt like forever checking the rooms, I got to the door at the end of the hallway. A door that wasn't there before, or well, maybe I couldn't see it. I opened it and inside I found another room, a really large room. It was like a big house, but nothing was in it except just one big wall a few meters away from me. I looked up to see the length of it, only to see there was no ceiling and neither the wall's end. 
White clouds covered the wall at one point while I gazed, trying to find an end, feeling my drool dripping on my shirt. A sharp feeling of pain burned through my legs as I fell on the floor, breaking out of my trance. How long was I staring upwards? A minute? An hour? I honestly have no idea. An odour entered my nose from behind me. I got up and saw a shade of crimson red forming a path, like someone was being dragged while bleeding. I followed it to the other side of the wall, where I found a kid resting his back by the wall while bleeding from his arms. It was Brooke. He hadn't grown an inch since the day he died. I rushed over, checking his arms and neck for a heartbeat. He didn't have one. Tears formed in my eyes as I looked down in shame, but Brooke spoke. Matt, Brooke said in a coarse, tired voice. How is he alive? Yeah, buddy, it's me. Yeah, you finally came. Yes, yes I did, I said with teary eyes. It's been four years since I saw him. I had to save him now. How do I get you out? Please tell me. He started saying something, but the floor beneath him turned black and into liquid, like someone dropped black ink in water. One moment he was sitting there, the next he was being sucked away on the black watery floor, calling for me. I grabbed his hand, but it came right off as I fell back in grimace, tossing his dismembered hand away as he got sucked in. I reached my hands in the liquid and was ready to dive in, but the floor turned white and solid again in a blink, and my arms were now stuck in the floor as I felt immense pain crushing my bones. I woke up in my bed, sweat running down my forehead as sunlit dared to blind me. I felt disoriented. I was in that place moments ago. Did the same thing happen as that night? My bag sat on the chair. I checked it, but it had nothing. Not even a trace of chalk powder I was carrying in it. That was definitely weird, but I found no traces of me going to the building that night. My shoes were clean and my jacket was hanging in the cupboard. There was a feeling in the back of my mind that this was all a dream. But of course, I didn't listen to it. Why would I? I searched for more traces of my visit. My car's odometer didn't count the distance till the building. And I even had food ready in my kitchen for breakfast. Exactly what I thought to have today. I was really going to put this off as a dream but not anymore. In the shower, I noticed marks on both my arms just below my shoulders, the same place where I was stuck on the white floor. I know for a fact it wasn't a dream. I don't know how I end up near my home every time the incident happens. All I know is that the ritual is real and that I found Brooke in that place after years. And Brooke might have all the answers. I will try to find out more about that place and tonight I will meet Brooke again and bring him back. A few days ago, while I was leaving for work, I saw a letter sitting on my doorstep. I picked it up and there was no information about where it came from or who sent it. I thought that I'd read it after I sat in a taxi to go to my workplace. After doing so, I opened it. There was no name on it either, but the contents of the letter were a little weird. It was labelled as list of rules on the top. This is what it read. This letter is sent to you because you will need it. It is of utmost importance that you don't throw this out and follow all the rules written on this paper correctly for the next seven days, and you might have a chance to make it out. Rule one, before going out for work, take two rounds around your house. Rule two, whatever you do, don't take the first taxi that approaches you, even if the driver says it's free of charge. Rule three, at exactly 3 p.m., go to the highest floor of whatever building you're in and look out of the window for five minutes. Don't respond or react 
to any voices you may hear. Rule four, don't eat or drink anything from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. They could have put something in it. Rule five, after arriving home, immediately lock all doors and windows so they don't get in. Rule six, at 10 p.m., close all the lights in your house and keep all the blinds open. They have the urge to see inside sometimes. Rule seven, don't answer any calls from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., no matter who's calling. If the same person calls more than three times, answer the call, but don't say anything, no matter what the caller is saying. They will get bored after a while. Good luck, adventurer. We hope to not see you on the other side. At first, I thought some kids had decided to play a prank on me, so I didn't pay much mind to it. Getting off at work, the driver said the ride was free of charge. That's weird, I thought. Then I remembered. Rule two, whatever you do, don't take the first taxi that approaches you, even if the driver says it's free of charge. What the hell? I pulled out the letter from my bag to confirm if that was the rule, and it was. Okay, that's a huge coincidence, I told myself. Nothing to be worried about. I said these things to calm myself, but still, I was freaking out a little. I arrived at my desk and started to work. After a while, I forgot about the taxi and the letter. After lunch, I arrived back at my desk and I heard a loud thud from behind me. Everyone in the office looked at the source of the sound and there was a thing standing there. It was all black in color and its head nearly touched the ceiling. I watched in horror as it picked up one of my colleagues from the ground and threw him out of the window. Everyone started screaming as it started coming towards us. It picked another of my colleagues and tore her head open and blood gushed out of it everywhere. I stumbled backwards and ran away from it. I went to the upper floor and hid in a closet because I figured I couldn't run from it easily. I heard screams and cries for help from the floor below me. I pulled out my phone and tried to call someone, but there was no signal. Then at one point, everything went quiet. I thought for a second that I was safe until I heard footsteps, not human footsteps. That thing was coming near me, coming for me. I put my hand on my mouth, trying not to make any sound. From the gap beneath the door of the closet, I saw a shadow, the shadow of that thing. I almost screamed, but the shadow just disappeared. I stayed there for a few minutes before coming out and I didn't see anyone. I slowly went down toward my desk and I saw everyone. Everyone was there. No blood on desks, no broken window. Even my colleagues who I saw dying were on their desks working. Hey man, you okay? My friend Mark asked. Y yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I sat back on my desk, trying to process what the hell just happened. That's when my gaze went towards the clock on my computer. 3.16 p.m. Chills went down my entire body. It took me some time to get to the closet, and I must have been in there for around 10 minutes, which means this thing could have come here at... A dreadful realization came over me, 3 p.m. I pulled out the letter and read rule three. At exactly 3 p.m., go to the highest floor of whatever building you're in and look out of a window for five minutes. Don't respond or react to any voices you might hear. This meant that the thing came here at 3 p.m., that whatever is written in the letter, it's true. The rules are real. Whoever sent this to me knew that this will happen and will keep happening for the next week. I couldn't take it. It was too bizarre. I asked my boss to leave early and came home. This time, I followed the rules and locked all the doors and windows. I was hungry, but decided not to eat anything till seven o'clock came around. After that, nothing really happened. I ate dinner and just chilled until 10 p.m. came. I turned off all the lights and shut the blinds. And I didn't have anything to do, so I just decided to sleep. 
Around 1 a.m., I was woken up by a thumping sound on my window. I got up to see what was causing it. I opened the blinds, and there was nothing there. I was about to open the window, but decided not to. Then suddenly, someone started banging on the window. I fell backwards on the floor, as there was still no one at the window. Or maybe I couldn't see who was there. The window started to crack. Just when it was about to break, the thumping stopped. I got up, drenched in sweat. I knew that whatever happened was because I didn't follow the rules when I left for work. I looked at the rules. I didn't follow rule one, rule two, rule three, and rule six. Fuck, I cursed myself. The blinds had to be open. I rushed through the entire house, opening all the blinds as fast as I could. After that, I couldn't sleep. I stayed up the entire night until the sun came out. I went outside and examined the window. It had to be removed. I'll do it in a few days, I thought. After that, I ate some food and headed for work. Of course, I followed all the rules this time. Took two rounds around my house. Didn't take the first taxi. Went to the highest floor in the building and looked out the window for a little while. But the voices. Everyone was screaming in the building, calling me out for help. But I didn't listen. I knew everything would be back to normal in five minutes. Basically, everything that I had to do, I did. But that night, I got a phone call from an unknown number. Following the last rule, I didn't pick up. It rang another time, and then it stopped. The next two days went by pretty smoothly. I did everything required and no calls came at night. I was thinking that I'll make it out of this hell soon enough. But on the night of the fifth day, a phone call came again from an unknown number. It rang once, it rang twice, it rang thrice. This time I had to pick it up. I answered and on the other end was my mother. Kirk, is that you? She said. It was so sweet hearing her voice again. It took everything I had in me not to speak to her. But I knew it wasn't her. It couldn't be. She had been dead for 14 years. Soon, she stopped speaking and the call ended. I burst into tears that I was holding back from the fear that she, it, would hear me. On the sixth day, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to know what was going on. So, I denied all the rules. I didn't take two rounds before leaving, and after sitting in the first taxi, I asked the driver who he was, to which he didn't reply. I kept asking him, and at one point, I faded out. When I opened my eyes again, I was standing on the street beside my workplace, and the taxi was nowhere to be seen. I went in and still followed rule three. I was too scared to see that thing again. I ate a pizza at 6am, kept all doors and windows open, and didn't turn off any lights at 10pm. I knew I'd regret it, but I just had to know what was going on, or I might turn crazy. At 1am, the phone rang from the same number came again. I picked it up on the first ring. Kirk? Are you there? said my mother's shaky voice. Mom, is that you? I asked, eager for an answer. But after that, she didn't speak. I just heard heavy breathing from the other end. I cried while speaking, begging the voice to speak just one more time. The call was cut off after a while. Immediately after, I heard a low voice coming from behind me. It was a black thing hovering over me. I tried screaming, but I couldn't. The thing wrapped itself around me. I couldn't do anything as it suffocated me. I woke up in my bed, breathing heavily. I looked around for that thing, but it was nowhere. I walked out of the bedroom and out on the street. It was nowhere. Actually, no one was here. I walked up to my neighbor's house and no one was in their house. I drove to my friend's house. No one was there either. I came back to my house and tried calling someone, but there was no signal. Suddenly, I hear a low, animal-like sound behind me. I look back, and a creature of some sort attacks me. 
Thankfully, it was small, so I was able to kick it and get it away. But after that, I heard another animal-like sound. Then another. Then another. More and more sounds emerged from the darkness. I ran into my bedroom, closed the windows and doors, and barricaded them with whatever I could. It's morning here now when I'm writing this. I can still hear the voices. I still hear those things outside. I figure I have only a few hours left with my phone's battery. Please, if someone sees this, please help me. I, 49 male, currently live in a pretty old apartment complex with my mom, 73. We've been here for about 13 years. The apartment complex has been here since maybe the late 80s. This all started a few years ago, when I was sleeping in the middle of the night, when something felt like two fingers touched me on the bottom of my feet. This happened four different times over a period of about a year. Then about a year later, it started affecting my mom. She sleeps on the couch so the TV we have can make her fall asleep. Hers started the same way, with a touch of two fingers on one of her exposed feet. Then one night, she was laying on her side with her hand out, and she felt someone grabbing and holding her hand. She also felt some warmth from whatever was holding her hand. And just now, my mom told me that she was sleeping last night. It was pretty cold last night, and she was bundled up, but she couldn't keep her feet warm. But sometime last night, she had her feet laying on her side, uneven. Then she felt something go under her blanket and push her feet up, so they can be even and a blanket put over her feet. My mom just told me this could be my grandma's way of communicating with us or something. She died about eight years ago, and my mom reminded me that she always loved holding hands with a family member. Would love to get some help trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Any help would be appreciated. I keep getting flashbacks from stuff that never happened to me, only to have it happening to me sometime after, sometimes exactly as I remember them, sometimes with slight alterations. It isn't a deja vu since those flashbacks happened first. Then, days, months, or even years later, the actual thing happens. I know this because every time I have one of those flashbacks, Yes, it seems like I'm remembering them more than foreseeing them. I remember it because of the feeling I get from it. It's a very strange sensation. The best way to describe it is that it's having a ball of cotton-shaped white light that is warm and cool at the same time inside your chest. It then spreads to your brain and makes you feel contempt, sort of inspired slash recharged and a little confused. I sleep a lot, especially during the winter because I like sleeping. Even more if I'm depressed, bored or just sad. With an oversleep schedule, these flashbacks tend to happen more often. This used to be a very frequent occurrence when I was younger. It lessened as I grew up, but it's still prominently there. Does anyone know what this is? Has it happened to you before? Does it have a name? context, this haunting, I guess I'll call it, happened from about 6 to 10 years old or so. I lived in a relatively new home, in a small neighbourhood in western Massachusetts. I had a loving family, and apart from what I will talk about here, a normal childhood. I'll start by saying I don't remember too much from my early childhood, but these experiences stand vividly in my mind, as if they happened yesterday. It started off when I was about six, with terrifyingly vivid recurring nightmares. Nightmares that seem out of place for a young kid, 
who was never allowed to be exposed to violence or horror content. One common one included me trying to desperately to jump up on my bed while a large snake slowly approached me from my hallway. I could feel pure and an unadulterated terror as it keeps closer and eventually struck me to which I would wake up in a sweat. One of the worst ones is where me and my father would be standing in front of a hallway that branched off to the left and led into my parents' room. Five to ten humanoid-like figures would bound out of the darkness of the hallway and proceed to eat both me and my father alive. I could hear him screaming as they reached him, and when they eventually reached me, I would wake up tingling where the humanoids had first bit down onto me. Keep in mind, I was very young when these dreams began, but they persisted for the next four years. Now, dreams alone are not enough for me to go on Reddit for the first time and pour out my childhood trauma to strangers. I remember I began to feel like I was being watched in my bedroom at night. It seemed like the darkness in my room became oppressive and I would be filled with pure dread and terror. Although I didn't know what, it felt as if something was about to happen, like every molecule in that room had stopped moving at once. This is when I first saw him. My bed was situated where my head was against a wall and the foot of my bed pointed towards a window. To my right was the door leading into my room on the same wall my head was against. Just to the left of that was a door on the adjacent wall leading into a Jack and Jill bathroom I shared with my sister. There was just enough light from the window that I could see the outline of a tall black figure with the outline of a top hat sitting on its head. I don't remember fully what his face looked like at least 10 years ago, but I do remember seeing some sort of liquid reflecting light where his face would have been. I quickly ripped the covers over my head and sat there frozen with terror, unable to move. This went on for many, many months. Every time that sense of dread filled me, I knew he was there, but wouldn't dare to look for fear that he would attack me. There were a few times that I was so convinced I was not going to make it, I screamed for my parents, and they always came running to find nothing. My dad would always tell me, who's the scariest thing in this house? To which I would lie and tell him it was of course my strong gusto father. He always assured me nothing would happen to me while he was there, but I knew if this thing wanted to do me harm, there was nothing he could do. Up to this point, by about eight years old, the nightmares had become more graphic and appearances more frequent. Always filling up that doorway, just standing, watching. Up to this point, I had never been physically touched or attacked by it. That was until one night when I was bunkered down beneath my sheets and that familiar feeling of dread washed over me. I froze in my bed with the same feeling of anticipation. Only this time, something would finally happen. There was a scraping noise that I could tell came from that bathroom and suddenly my leg was grabbed through the covers. I freaked out, bawling, crying and beelined to my parents' room where I stayed for the night. I was never touched again but he was there most nights until we moved to States when I was 10. Of course, I tried to explain what was happening to me, but it always brushed off and I eventually stopped talking about it as no one believed me and I didn't want to scare my little sister any more than I had already. Fast forward to two years ago when I was 18, sifting through old storage boxes filled with my old school drawings and notebooks my parents had kept. I was flipping through a school notebook filled with grammar practice and such when my heart sank. There in my school notebook was a drawing of the top hat man. I practically shoved it down my parents' throats while shouting, see I told you it's the fucking top hat man. My parents went pale and profusely apologized for not believing me. They even went as far as to ask me if I needed counseling. In reality, I was relieved that I had some proof and today I absolutely love horror as a genre. I guess maybe because it gives me a feeling of control I never had as a kid. If anyone has any questions or insights to offer me, be more than welcome. 
If you had a similar experience, please tell me about it. I'm going to try and attach the pictures I took of my elementary school notebooks. But like I said, it's my first time posting here and I'm still not entirely sure if I'm doing this right. I have stories of paranormal activity, but it's never scary to me, just annoying as fuck. When I was little, I was playing on the sofa and my foot got stuck in between the cushions. Something grabbed my foot. I couldn't set it free, so I started screaming for help. My mom came into the room and immediately it let go. My mom didn't believe me, I don't blame her. I tried recreating to see what just happened and it didn't happen again. It happened a few more times. Then I just stopped jumping on the sofa altogether. Being touched while I sleep. This is more recent. I hate being touched in the first place, so this just irks me to no end. I don't have any pets that free roam other than a hamster. I thought it was a bug and I just recently got this mattress for a hefty price. I cleaned out my sheets and bedding. To just cover my bases, I did a deep clean of my whole apartment, but I never saw anything. The next time it happened, I was so pissed because I love my sleep. I just said, stop touching me, and it just stopped. It always made my feet butt and face. It's like, yes, I'm human. I bet you were human at one point too. This anatomy is not unfamiliar to you, so just leave me alone. After saying stop, it hasn't occurred again. My blanket's been pulled off the bed. This is more recent too. I was scared the first time. I couldn't go back to sleep, but now I'm just plain annoyed. All of my paranormal experiences have been more annoying rather than scary. Nothing like the movies, but I know movies dramatize things. What about y'all? It was August when I moved in. At the time, my mother had been suffering from multiple health issues for months and had to be in and out of different hospitals fairly often. She and my father slept in different bedrooms since he had grown more and more agitated about my father's loud snoring. In the months that I stayed with them, my mother's bedroom always made me feel a bit uncomfortable. She had rose pink organza drapes hanging around the canopy bed and the room didn't get much direct sunlight since its only window faced the northeast. I never wanted to stay there for longer than 15 minutes. Due to her illness, my mother lost more than 30 pounds and weighed in me at 85 pounds by the end of October. She had all these antibiotic resistant infections affecting multiple organs. Her doctors were extremely puzzled and couldn't pinpoint what the actual causes were. It was heart-wrenching to see my mother slowly withering into an extremely frail and depressive person. At one point, she even thought that she was dying. In early December, one of my mother's cousins came over to the house for the first time and was very concerned about my mother's bedroom immediately. It's full of messy energies, as she described how she felt, and said it gave her a bad headache as soon as she entered the bedroom. That got my parents' attention. My mom's cousin informed my parents that she knew someone special who might be able to help with my mother's odd illness. The person was a medicine man slash feng shui master. Running out of options, my parents agreed to invite the master to the house the following week. I was home with them on the day the master arrived. He first instructed my father to remove all the wooden statues my father had collected over the years. You can put them in the garage or storage room, definitely not in your living space, the master claimed. According to him, each of those statues carried their own chaotic energies and were not the friendly ones. When he entered my mother's bedroom, he shook his head in disbelief, told us that there were things he did not like and that he needed to get rid of them ASAP. He handed my father a hulu, calabash in Chinese, used by traditional medicine men slash women as containers for various substances. 
The master told my father to leave it in my mother's bedroom with the lid open, and then we waited. That was in the late afternoon. My father and the master's assistant were at work, moving the wooden statues from the house to the garage, while my mother rested in the guest bedroom with me. Around dinner time, my mother started to develop a horrible panic attack. She was extremely jittery, short of breath, and couldn't stop scratching her chest. She told me it felt like something was inside her chest and she needed to get it out. I had never seen my mother that way. Her face and chest were beet red and she had acted like a wounded, angry animal. Scared and alarmed, I ran to the garage to tell everyone what was going on. The master yelled out, we've got something. He instructed my father to retrieve the hulu from my mother's bedroom and put the lid back on. My father followed the order and brought out the hulu, then handed it to the master. Right after that, my mother's panic attack subsided quickly, like nothing had ever happened. Her face and chest returned to her normal pale fair tone, with visible red scratch marks she had done to herself just moments ago, and she was calm. The master grabbed the hulu and stared at it for a while, then closed his eyes before declaring that we caught it. What was in the hulu? We all wanted to know. According to the master, it seemed to be a type of black magic, an ill-intended spell that someone had cast onto the house. However, my mother was not necessarily the target. It was only because she had a weak immune system to begin with that made it easy for the bad energy to attach onto her. Strangely, after that unexplainable event, my mother's health was improving day by day. The next spring, she regained her health. Even the doctors were amazed by it. No, my parents didn't tell the doctors what had happened with the master, since they didn't think the doctors would believe them after all. That was more than 10 years ago. Until today, we still had zero idea what the hell was going on. I'm just feeling grateful that my mother is still with us, with good health and all. And they still live in that house, happily and peacefully. So when I first moved to my current house like 10 years ago, and I never really felt alone. Like there would always seem to be some feeling of someone being nearby. And the place just had an incredibly ominous feeling to the atmosphere. You could hear distinct footsteps upstairs when no one else was home and movement in the shadows. I know it sounds cliche, but that's truly how it began. The basement was always worse than the rest of the house. There was just an incredibly strong foreboding feeling whenever you passed the halfway mark of the stairs. It always felt like someone was right behind you. The door to the boiler room would always pop open and creak like an inch or two before just stopping. Didn't matter if you slammed the door or gently closed it. The door would always creak back open within the hour. Then there was the whispering that would happen if you ignored the door for too long. And as time passed, the whispering began to happen to me, even if I wasn't in the basement. The voice always changed depending on the circumstances. If I was home alone, then it was always the voice of my family members calling my name. But when I called back, the whisper would just keep repeating my name, beckoning me to come to the source of the sound, until I went and investigated. Only then would the whispers stop. For extra info, my house is a decent size, so if someone isn't loud enough, then they can sound like a distant whisper, which is why I kept investigating it. If I wasn't home alone, the whispers would be an inaudible but masculine voice that always originated from right behind me. It didn't matter if I tried to play the TV really loud or if I wore headphones, the whispers were always audible. That was the extent of the activity for around a year, until one day, a tapping started in my closet. It was never random and always occurred in some type of pattern, like tap, 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 tap. And it would start up randomly and end randomly, but only when I would be home alone or between sunset and sundown. The tapping varied in length, lasting for a few minutes and restarted every few hours or 
Sometimes it would go for hours and then just stop for the remainder of the night. It was incredibly random. I thought it was maybe a leaky pipe or something of the sorts, but there were no pipes in that part of the wall. My room was on the top floor and there were no sinks or showers for 15 plus feet. And no mold or water stains ever appeared on the wall of the closet or the ceiling beneath my room. I was absolutely terrified to go to bed because of the sounds. But around that time, my blanket began coming off in the middle of the night. I know that sounds like the result of basic restless sleeping, but it would always be neatly folded into a square on the floor by the foot of my bed. It was absolutely horrific to have to attempt to pull the blanket off the floor and unfold it while trying to cover myself again, while knowing that whatever did that could still be in my room. I began sleeping with headphones on while playing natural white noise to make sleeping in that room easier, but it was still incredibly nerve wracking. After a few months of getting used to the closet tapping and learning to live with everything going on, whatever was in my house began to actively terrorize me during the daylight hours. The way my house is designed, there is one big living room that is separated by a wall divider to give the illusion of creating two rooms, but there's no door or anything to physically block things or sounds. The entity would start scratching the carpet like a dog does on the opposite side of the divider from me, and then slowly the scratching would come over to the right in front of where I was. Didn't matter if I was on the couch or in a chair, it would come right in front of me and scratch until I reacted. If I moved to a different seating spot, it would follow me. If I ignored it, then it wouldn't stop. But I admit that the longest I tried to ignore it was only 30 minutes. So maybe if I held out, then it would have stopped eventually. That would happen like every day until I learned that it would stop if I left the house. So I think it wanted to exercise its power over me or something. Like it was letting me know that it owned the house and I was simply being allowed to stay. But even if I left the house after the scratching, it would still happen again every three or four days like clockwork. I thought I was absolutely crazy because no one else was experiencing these things. Until one day when the scratching got too close to my dog and he began to bark at it before running over to join me on the couch and growling at whatever it was as it got closer. I complained to my mom and siblings, told them that I didn't like the dogs and that I was scared to go home after school. But I used to have a very active imagination, so they would tell me to be quiet or stop talking crazy. My faith in my mom was absolutely shattered and has still never truly recovered after being dismissed so many times. All she would do was wave her hand and say, in the name of Jesus, you're safe and tell me to go away. After around three years of living in that house, around a year after the scratching began, around years after the closet tapping began, the tapping started happening in the closet at my father's house as well. So I'm like 87% sure whatever it was attached to me for some reason. I tried praying. I tried never being home alone. I even forced myself to get rid of my imagination to end the terror, but nothing changed. It wasn't until my brother told my mom he converted religions that my mother blessed the house with holy anointed oil. She dipped her finger in oil and put a cross on every doorway in the house to force out his evil spirits that made him doubt Christianity, that it finally stopped. The door opening, the shadows, the scratching, the whispers, they stopped that day. But the occasional ominous feelings and the footsteps both happen occasionally and I'm personally fine with that. So that's the background, but not too long ago, I feel like it's been picking up again. I had my college dorm mates come home with me since there were no flights back to his country due to them closing their borders. And he began investigating the occult while in my home. Not with Ouija boards or anything, just doing basic research and all that. Maybe he reawakened something. So while that roommate was still at my house, he began saying that he felt uncomfortable being alone in any room in the house and began walking around with headphones. 
After we left my house to stay elsewhere, the ominous feeling began to return more frequently than it has for the past six or seven years. And I began to see things dart around, corners, or move around in the dark really quick every now and then. But this time it's more physical as well. A little while after the activity began to pick up again, I was sleeping in my sister's old room alone, and something cold grazed my back, so I woke up, looked around, and laid back down. I had assumed it was the AC vent or something, but I was tired and forgot that the AC doesn't work in that room. Just as I was about to fall asleep again, it gently stroked my back again. That time there was no mistaking it. It felt like four small, petite fingers glided across the entirety of my back, from my shoulder to just a few inches above my butt. I immediately went under the blanket and it stopped. But I was awake by that point. I eventually calmed myself down by thinking about it, and I concluded that it was different from the haunting I had as a child. Whatever touched me seemed feminine and almost caring or gentle, like it hadn't meant to frighten me. A few nights later, I began to hear footsteps leading up to the second bed in the room. After my sister left, we put a second bed in there so that guests could stay over if they so desired. And then the footsteps would stop before I heard sounds similar to someone sitting on the bed and adjusting themselves. I saw nothing and didn't feel threatened. So I just sort of began talking about what I was doing and how I was feeling. And after a few minutes of that, I saw the bed spring up and heard the sound of the bed springs resetting before the sound of the footsteps went back towards the door and stopped. At that point, I got a little nervous because I couldn't chalk it up to me being a little crazy, but I wasn't truly frightened or anything. That exact thing ha began to happen every few days or so, typically when I was getting ready for bed, so I just made a routine of greeting it and talking aloud of my thoughts. After a few weeks of this, however, the activity changed and I didn't quite like it. I was minding my own business and relaxing when the bedroom door began to shake, like someone was grabbing the handle and twisting it, but not opening the door. While shaking it violently, in the past, the door would shake occasionally if a semi-truck passed by in the neighborhood, but this was way more intense of a rattling and I have exercise bands on the floor which have never rattled with the door before, but they did this time. Which startled me because that never happens. I yelled at whatever was shaking the door to piss off you damn prankster. And it stopped for a minute, before the door started rattling again, but softer this time. I yelled out, enough! I acknowledge that you're there. And I walked over to the door, grabbing the doorknob, and started shaking it back. I stood there for a moment to see if there would be a response, but the shaking ended. Since this event, I had my mother pray in that room and bless it, since she has become a much more devout person than I am, and all the activity in that room has ceased. At this point, I began to remember everything, and I decided to ask around since I was older now, and my words would be more respected. I talked to my mum about it, and she said that something shook her bed once, but she told it to leave her alone in the name of Jesus, and it stopped. But she also said that while I was complaining to her about the ghost stuff, that my sister had been telling her about a man in a fedora-type hat, who would stand in the corner and shadow figures in the dark before the house was blessed the first time, but claims that she never mentioned it after that. I have a theory that maybe she had paranormal experiences that never went away and that's what caused her to go off the deep end and start doing drugs and running around the streets at all hours. Due to her past actions, I'm pretty low contact with that sister, but in my pursuit of answers I am thinking about writing her a letter to ask her about experiences. My other sister, however, claims that when she lived in the basement, that she hated being there alone because it felt like someone was always watching her, especially when she was in the shower or trying to sleep. She stayed out the house as often as possible or would have boys over just so that she wouldn't be home alone. After around six months to a year before I began spending a lot of my time in the basement, she got pregnant and moved out. 
She said that she never mentioned it to anyone because she didn't want to sound crazy or scare us since my, sub my siblings and I were so much younger than her. My brother claims that he has experienced nothing and tries to logic everything away, which is a good thing, but if you confront him with undeniable proof of something happens when he was also present, we witnessed the carpet scratching once and ran upstairs before locking ourselves in our rooms. He will deny it ever happened and refuse to talk about it. He's always been the type to try and conceal and hide everything that happens to him, or what he feels, so I don't expect him to really answer my questions honestly anytime soon. I definitely want to find answers and to end this once and for all if I can. My nephews want to start spending the night with me, and I want to make sure they never experience the things that I did. As I'm sure some of you are aware, the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I've, 25 female, began spending a decent chunk of time in the stand with my partner, in life and in most ventures generally, because we've discovered that hogs have been rooting up the oats and generally causing havoc and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks, attempting to catch the miscreants at it. So far, no luck. Very frustrating. At any rate, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand, after dark, than I ever have in my life. We've been up there from 9pm to 1am, 10pm to 2am, 9pm to 11am, and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant or helps paint a picture. There have been a few things that have happened that I've struggled to explain away or rationalise, and my partner is out of ideas too. The first thing happened about a, about a week and a half, or two weeks ago. It was around one or two in the morning, with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area. I was only half paying attention to my surroundings, because I'd already written the night off as a bust, when all of a sudden, I became aware of a weird whirring slash flapping sound. I thought it originated from something behind me, but my partner said he heard it coming from away and to the front slash left of us. At any rate, it was loud, airborne, and passed quickly over us and away. I'm very familiar with the sound drones make, and this wasn't it. It also wasn't a helicopter. The sound was too small, if that makes sense. And it wasn't a bird. It sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line. You couldn't see anything. The second thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the stand, but it was weird and out of the norm, so I'll mention it. We live on the same property that the stand is on. It was around 9 or 10 at night, when all of a sudden there was a distant boom like an explosion, which hit our home like a thud. If you've spent any time around heavy artillery or explosive, you know what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us asking what the hell just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion, but the weird part is, is that my partner did some internet digging, and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any info on an unknown explosion back in 2016, during the same time of year. We still have no clue what it was. And then, lastly, tonight. We were out in the stand once again. It's gotten cold, and we've had a ton of rain all day, so everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10 and it was about 10.30. I was preoccupied with trying to keep my fingers and toes warm when suddenly I became aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too, but he was hearing damage so I don't think he heard the full breadth of the tones. To me, it kind of sounded like muffled voices off in the distance, like several someones having a conversation too far off to make out the individual words. But the direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings, it's just woods. And there were several different tones. My partner said it kind of sounded like a cow moaning, but not quite. There are cattle in the area, and we hear them vocalising all the time. This wasn't that. 
and there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound's origins. They carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose in a crescendo, and then died off and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct these sounds were. If I hadn't been listening intently, I don't know if I would have heard it. All of this, coupled, coupled with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out in the dark alone, has me wondering. I don't necessarily feel endangered, I just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts and I try to listen to them. I'd love to know what you all think. There may be rational explanations for all these phenomena. All I know is, I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story. But I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge, lol. Thanks for reading. <laughs>